If you're in the auditorium, please turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And just a quick, I always want to review what we spoke about previously based upon any multitude of questions that I had. And of course, in Genesis chapter one, we saw God showed us how he created the earth. Did he not? And then we're going to chapter two is also talking about creation, just gives a little more detail. It's kind of like when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you can read the same story, but one of the gospels may shed more light in a certain area. Now, the two points I want to reiterate about Genesis chapter 1, who can tell me what the word God was in chapter 1? What word did we say? David Tan flew up. Yes, sir. Elohim, what does that mean? That is the correct Hebrew word, but what does that mean? That's so important because sometimes when we say God, we by default mean God the Father, but that's not necessarily true. What does Elohim mean? You can go ahead, David. The plurality of God. Matter of fact, in that same chapter, it gives us examples. It says, let us make man in our image. That's the So what does the plurality of God mean? And we say it, it means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The actual term uh, refers directly to divine nature. There are three personalities that have the complete divine nature. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We okay with that? Now, also, when you look at the days of creation, at the beginning, it says he created light and separated it from the darkness. Was that the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars? Mm, no response. Remember, this is review. Say again. I didn't hear you. Oh, it, at the beginning of creation, it says God uh, created light and separated her from the darkness. Was that talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars? Not at all, because as we refer, I think it was day four. Specifically, it said God made the sun and the stars. Then what was that light talking about? And remember, we want to use, I've heard opinions all over, but we can use scripture. What, what do we think that light was according to scripture? Your hand up, David, or you're halfway? You're resting your, you're resting your arm? Go ahead, buddy. No, not necessarily. We know that a full day was day and night. Yes. Yes. No, because you go further down, you're going to read where he's going to uh, he's going to create the sun and the moon and the stars. Matter of fact, let's go back and look at look at the actual verse. Uh. Said, let the firmament the mess and God made the firmament and God. God said, let the waters and God said, let there be dry land. Where are we at? Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. That means the sky of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let there be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Those are two different lights. What I submit for your consideration once again, I want to make sure, go to, I think it was Revelation 22 and 5. Quickly. 
Revelation 22 and the verses 5. Now, this is talking about when we're in heaven. Does anybody know if there's going to be a sun, S-U-N, and a moon and stars in heaven? Let's look at this verse. And there shall be no night there. Talking about heaven. And, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, S-U-N. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, this is the beginning, and when you get to Revelation, it's going back to how pure it was from the beginning. And it said the light that gave them the illumination to see was God himself. Do we see evidence of that in the Bible? Remember when Moses went to Mount Sinai the first time? And remember when he came down, what did, it, what did it say about Moses? Yes, sir. That's exactly, and why did it show him? It tells you. That's right, he had been in the presence of God. And God's, and the word is illumination, God's illumination, when Moses came down from him, it, it's, it's shown on Moses. So this early light is the revelation of God allowing his illumination to be seen, the brightness to be seen, not the sun and the moon and stars, but the illumination from God himself. And we see that in scripture. People will make up stuff, well, it was a sun that eventually change. Where, where's that at? Mm -mm. Well, we see God's illumination. Does that make sense? Now, let's drop down to in chapter 2. It says, thus the heavens, why is heavens plural? I expect you all to know this. Why is heavens plural? Yes, Sister Lopez. A little bit louder. Yes, and he said it was good. Well, which meaning he stopped from his work. I didn't hear that last part. Yes, morning and evening. Well, the word hours didn't come up. That, that came through science. God gave us, according to Genesis 1, a day was the morning and the evening. And then morning and evening. That, that's what a day was. And, you know, even if you go to Israel today, you know when the next day starts? Sunset. So they're probably more accurate biblically than we are. Because our next day doesn't start till after midnight. But according to Genesis, the day and the night, people get into the 24 hours. That's science. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's 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 man made. Like we say, we could say that's why I traditionally say the first day of the week or the Lord's Day. Bible doesn't say Sunday. You know what Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is. Those came from Greek gods. And it was just incorporated into our vernacular. But I say first day of the week, just like the Bible says. That's that's it was the morning and the evening. Now, now they had a yes, they had a Julian calendar. I can't I can't speak the Hebrew words, but they had Hebrew Hebrew words for the days. How did the days do what? No, that's that's Western technology. They had different words for those days. And they were Hebrew words, but it was based upon the Bible. Sun coming up, sun going down. That was a day. Sun going up, sun going down. That was a day. And it was and they, it was a seven day calendar, and the first day of the in the first day of the, of the of the week was the Lord's day. Now 
That's where man came in. That's a whole nother full lesson, too. I can't take the whole class for that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the ninth hour. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We have to always remember, especially in, 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 in this day and age, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong, but we have to, give me one second here. We have to remember man has worked his way in. And I always like to say the Bible contains science, but the Bible is not a science book. The Bible contains a lot of history. You can read about Alexander the Great in the Bible, but it's not a history book. We start from what God said. And then, and then we venture into these things. That's so important. Many times we read Daniel. Who's heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Now, is there anything wrong with saying their names that way? Not necessarily, but you know, those are fa the false god names they gave the he to the Hebrew boys. Their, their God-given names were Hananiah, Ash uh, Azariah, and Meshach. And the same thing has been done with the days of the week, the days of the month. Man has changed them and we've acclimated right toward it. But it's best to go all the way back to what God gave us and then work from there. I think I told you, I remember debating, I spoke to, I knew a, a Church of Christ scientist that attended USC. Then there was one who wasn't Church of Christ. And they were debating the long day of Joshua. And the one that wasn't a Christian kept saying, well, how? Because in the book of Joshua, Joshua and the nation of Israel was battling the icons, I believe. And Joshua prayed to God to extend the day so that he would have more time to fight. And God did. And the one scientist that was in Church of Christ said, that's virtually impossible. And I said, why? I said, because according to science, if the earth were to, if the, if the sun was to do that, and all the Church of Christ science said was, do you realize you're saying that the God who created all of this, the sun, and the earth, he can't do that? He says, you don't understand that we're dealing with an almighty God, an all-powerful God. I thought that was so well said. It's just man has added some things to it, and we have to be careful. When you look at this Bible, and when I say this Bible, I mean the actual print and everything. Did this come from the church of Christ? No. It came from a place called Thomas Bible Publishing. They are not church of Christ. It's still a good Bible. It's King James. And I use it for the good that it is. You know, when the Bible was first put out, when the Bible, when God gave the first Bible down, it didn't have book, chapter, I mean, it had names, but it didn't have chapter and verses. Not at all. You know who introduced chapters and verses in the Bible? It's going to blow your mind if you do your research. The early Catholic Church to make it easier. Now, does that mean it's wrong? No, as long as it stays in context, as long as we study. But we have to know where man has put his two cents and know where to divide and know where we're safe. Does that make sense? Getting back to chapter two, it says, thus the heavens. Oh, I said, why is the word heaven used plural there? Is that a typo? David. There are three heavens. What are they? God's home, the place where we want to go. That's right. We got God's home. Then we have outer space. Then we have the realm of the board of fowls of the air. Oh, God. Those are three levels of heaven. So don't let that scare you. I don't like skipping over these words. 
It says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. I like to make a comment there. When you look at how God created all things and then how he left them to a certain order. You know, when God created stuff, he said it was good. Did he not every single time? And when he gets and I'll come right to you, Brother Lopez. When he gets to, to the very end of, of chapter one, he says that it was very good. But he created it supernaturally. Then he left it to natural order. You know, everything that he made, he made supernaturally because there's nothing there. And then he created it. And then he left it to natural order for it to be good. Yes, Brother Lopez. Mm, I see no evidence of that. The Bible talks about the firmament where the fowls of the air fly. And it talks about the firmament where the sun, moon, and stars are. And we know it talks about the place where God resides. Third heaven. Mm-hmm. That's another confirmation of it. But to go beyond that is not in Scripture. Brother Lee, was your hand up? Okay. <laughs> we all right? Let's see. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. And that's really what the rest means. A lot of times when you see the word rest because of the English, you think, ah, like I had me a good nap today, Brother Lopez. Good nap. Because I went out and had to do some things and it was hot. JV was real hot. I came in, I sat down in that lazy boy, and I had me a good night, a good rest. That's not the context of the Hebrew word rest. It simply means he stopped the work that he was doing. And can you imagine God stopping work and saying, this is very good. We're going to see in chapter two, though, where there's one particular situation where he said, this is not good. We're going to talk about that briefly said, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. What is meant by that? And sanctified it. What did it mean? Uh, Brother Darrell, he set it apart. Now, was, did he set it apart for the church? You don't see any scripture that says that. This was given to the nation of Israel specifically. And we'll see that as we go further into the book and we look at other scriptures. But that was never given to the church. And I think I mentioned this on Wednesday. If you deal with people like, uh, anybody ever dealt with the Seventh-day Adventists? One question they love to say is, I remember one guy said, Brother Nelson, he was real flamboyant. Brother Nelson, when did God change the day of worship from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. He said he never changed it because the worship day was never on the seventh day of the week. And they use that and it's, the scriptures are in there. The seventh day of the week, the Sabbath and the Lord's day are two totally separate days. Go to Matthew 27 real quick. I like to reiterate points that you may hear if you're talking to people. Matthew 27. First of all, you never find in the New Testament the disciples worshiping on the seventh day of the week. If you, if you find one, let me see it. You will never see them doing that. There's an emphasis on the first day of the week because that's the day that Christ was rose again. It makes perfect sense. But it was never on the Sabbath. Go to Matthew 27. Let me get the verse. Look at the first verse of Matthew chapter 28. Read it with me. 
It says, in the end of the what? As it began to dawn toward the. So the Sabbath came before the first day of the week. In the Western world, it would be a Saturday. You follow me? Came Mary Magdalene and the other and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. The Sabbath was never established as a day of worship. It was given to the nation of Israel as a day of rest, and they had certain rules. And sometimes when you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see how the Pharisees and Sadducees had to try to add to that. But Jesus spun it on them every time. Remember the one when they said, well, teacher or rabbi, if you have an ox, should you be working with your ox? I'm paraphrasing. You know what Jesus said? Well, what if that ox fell in a ditch? You just going to let it lie in there and die? Meaning that you're supposed to help, help it out. And then I love how G Jesus said, God didn't make man for the Sabbath, but made Sabbath for man. And then he ended by saying, I am the Sabbath. In other words, you should be listening to me, meaning him, meaning Jesus. That's the authority. They had got it all mixed up. They were using it to strain people. And that was not the, the context of the Sabbath. Plus, if they would have understood Old Testament law, because people say, well, Jesus obeyed the Sabbath. Yes, the Bible says he was made under the law. Jesus followed it until he was crucified and came back. Then all that was fulfilled and taken away. That's why many times Jesus said, you have heard it said, but now I say. Remember what was old, the old saying? Yeah, the bone to bone, tooth by tooth, eye for an eye. But then what did Jesus say? But now I say, if you have ill someone in your heart, you've committed sin already. He had a much higher standard. Did I see a hand? Sister Lopez? It, yeah, in a sense, when when, when that when that law applied, yes. That's that's the thing. It was it was such a mix up. Such a mix up. And when you study, you know, you had synagogues and you had the temple. When you visit, when you really analyze the synagogues, they were like the early denomination because each synagogue didn't do the same thing. Yes. That's exactly right. That's why Jesus took the opportunity sometime to go in there and to teach them. It's amazing. That's why it's so important and be thankful to be in the church that Jesus died for. Because it's sad some of the stuff that's being taught out there. Thank you, Sister Lopez. Verse number four. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth which they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God gave not, I'm sorry, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Isn't that something? How do you grow something today? You got to have at least three things. You got to have at least some form of seed. You got to have water and sun. See how God did this supernaturally? But then he's going to put it in the natural order of things. Because Adam wasn't tilling the ground yet. But look what God did to allow the, the, the water to be wet or the ground to be wet. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know what makes me laugh a little bit with this? Many, many of you remember when you were a little girl or a little boy, and you did anybody ever play in mud? I don't mean jumping in it, but almost like clay. Yes. Daryl, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Not only that, you know, it says God made man of the dust of the earth. You know, when you trace the Hebrew word for dust to what the word is, it's a four letter word. Word is clay. Clay. And I don't know if you've ever driven across the country the way I have. When you get into places like Tennessee and you look along the side of some of the where they cut away. You know how many colors clay comes in? We often think of clay as like this docile gray or a little brown. They have red clay, white clay. It comes in a multiplicity of colors. And when I saw that, I thought about Genesis. But God formed man out of the clay of the earth. And notice it said, what did it do? What did he do? He breathed in the what? Does nostrils he gave man the breath of life. This is all, it's not the Holy Spirit. This is just the spirit of life that everybody has that's alive anyway. Yes. We were born one, one more time. Body, soul, spirit, yes. I still can't hear you. No, no, the 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 the, uh, the spirit of life does not become holy. When we're baptized, Acts 2 and 38, we receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That becomes betwixt with our spirit. again it's the spirit of life that God gives every human being that's what makes us come alive God's spirit that's not the Holy Spirit though the Holy Spirit is only given to those who become a Christian yes That creates the spirit of life in us. Is it what again? I guess you could, yes. The reason why I call it spirit of life because it's a spirit and it's what gives you life. Just a play on words. But we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. No, the soul is created directly by God. That has nothing to do with this. We're all born with a body and a soul, and God breathed into us the spirit of life. I can only assume the scriptures doesn't tell it. A lot of people like to say we were made in God's image. There's three in the Godhead, so there's three parts of us. That's not the context, though. I can't go there. That's a that's a nice little connection, but no. The idea that we're made in the image of God talks about when the context of that is, he says, then we will have rulership over all the angels. I mean, not over all the angels, over all the animals. That's the context because God has given us a brain for reasoning. Other animals didn't have that. That's the context of when he says it, not so much the, the spirit, the body, and the soul. But that became a part of us when God made us. Yes, Brother Lopez. Mm -hmm. You mean right then and there was woman created? <clears throat> well, what woman was created, woman was created later though.
Okay, where where are we at? Well, we haven't got down to there yet. I want I want to stay in order in the order that we're going. One and twenty seven. So God created man in his image and in the image of God created him and male and female. This is an overview. Chapter two is going to say exactly how it was done. Because God made man from Adam's rib. Yes. I'm not following that, Brother Lopez. I can only, I'm only going to be emphatic about what, what the Bible says. I can't add anything to it. That's the overview. He created them both. And then now we get in chapter two, he's going to show how it was done. That's what I'm saying. That's in context with scripture. The, you keep saying the spirits. What is that? You mean the human spirit? When you say created the body, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you that that's the order. I'm just saying God created man out of the dust or the clay of the earth. And then after he created man, he created a woman from the rib. That's what the Bible is going to tell us in a few minutes. But when we go by order, the way it says on chapter 127, it says, And I keep saying, chapter 1 is the overview. Chapter 2 gets more than the specifics. I don't want to go back and forth because it's not fair to the whole class. We can talk about this after. But I'm saying chapter two is going to get into the specifics. And I will never say, well, this was made here. This was made here. The Bible doesn't clearly say it. Let's finish chapter two. Then let's come back to that question. Daryl, you had a question? Spirit of life. That's right. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. In verse nine, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know about that. Verse 10. Now we're going to talk about these rivers and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compass the whole land of Havilah, which made there is gold and the gold of that land is good. There is Bendelum and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. In the last verse. And the name of the third river is Hedekel. That is which toward the east, Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, does anybody know one of those rivers still exists? Which one is it? Anybody know where it is? I had the pleasure of putting my foot in it. It's over near Iran and Iraq. And it's still called the Euphrates River. But notice what God is doing here. Well, I want to overlook something. What is God doing here? Is that the first bell? What is God doing here? He's setting up a place where man can exist. Got him a place to live, a place where he has to work. And right now, God is providing everything. Shouldn't that be enough? 
But he's going to say that something's not good, though. We're going to read about it soon. Yes, J.D. Yes. And it's, and, it's, and it's essential for us. He created it for us. Bible says, and the Lord God took the man and put him, see, in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. God gave him a job. How hard is it to, how hard is it to work in a place that God has prepared for you? should be easy. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Anybody know what that, what kind of die is that talking about? The D-I-E, David. But what kind? Spiritual death. That's exactly right. Now, good place to be. God created it for you, gave you a clear job, and gave you only one rule. Imagine having that. To me, that sounds ideal. But you know, man, I'm not trying to put down Adam or Eve when you get to that point. But does it get any easier? Does it get any easier? One rule, JV. Just don't do this. But yet, yet you can freely eat. All the trees you have there, just don't eat this. So why is your focus on that? Yes. Well, the, the Bible doesn't tell us, but the Bible tells us it, it fell on the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's all flesh. As opposed to listening to what God said, watch how they le lean in to what Satan said. In other words, they let the flesh get to them more so than what God said. And that's a direct parallel today. I'm reminded this is an earthly story, but it's one that I love to read about the uh, conquistador that went down in, uh, near the Yucatan Peninsula. When he arrived, he came off the ship with his men, and they had they all arrived on three boats. He said, we're going to take this land. We're going to take all the gold. We're going to go back to the queen. And they were like, yeah. He said, burn all of our boats. And they were looking. They were like, why? He said, because we're going to take the land and take all their resources. We don't need these boats. Burn the boats. You know what he created? He created natural motivation. Now they had to win. Talk about a focus. And they stayed on that focus and they got it. True, that's a true story in world history. Now think about us. Has God given us clear things we should and should not do? When do we often fall? When we respond to the flesh. The Bible says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Everything that can tempt us falls under those three, three categories. You ever wondered why? How many times was Jesus tempted in Matthew 4 anyway? How many times was Jesus tempted by Satan? Anybody know? You said two JV or four or three? Oh, yes. Three times. Why only three? was not so much that he couldn't go anywhere else. If you look at the, the three ways that he tempted Jesus, one was in the lust of the eyes. What was that? When he took him up top and let him see all the kingdoms of the world. One was the pride of life. What was that? He took him atop the, the chapel and said, jump off. You have charge of angels. They'll come in and take care of you. And then one, when, what was the lust of the flesh? Turn his bread to stone. He hit those. That's why the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all ways yet without sin. He was tempted in all major categories. Satan couldn't go anywhere else. He had to leave. And I try to encourage Christians. Like, Satan can only hit you three ways. And can Satan come up and tempt JV, Sister Lopez, Brother Lopez, B, Brother Stark, all at the same time? No, he's not omnipresent. 
He has limited power. His power is the influence in this world. We have the advantage because we study, we know better, and we have the Holy Spirit. We don't give ourselves enough credit. We give Satan too much credit. One of the funniest cartoons I've ever seen, little caricature, is Satan sitting there on the, on the street with his head down. And somebody walked over to him and said, why are you so down? Guess what he said? After what I said, can you all guess why I said it was down? He said, I don't have much power as I used to have. It's just we give in. We give in. I've heard people say, I know Satan got into me. And my next question is, why did he pick you out of all everybody in the world? Why did he pick you? No, you gave into something. You got to take full accountability and full responsibility. Was that the second bell? Let's take one more scripture and then we'll be done. Verse 19, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam. See what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name therefore. Look at the authority he gave Adam. Look at the place where he gave Adam to live. Look at the sustenance that he had. And he only had to avoid one rule. That's amazing, isn't it? And the purpose is not for us to look at Adam and say, Adam, man, you messed it up for everybody. That's not the purpose. The purpose is for us to realize how susceptible to the flesh we can be if we're not careful. We can look so much at what's not going wrong. I mean, what's not going right. And forget about what's going right. We're going to end on the fact, never define your life by the circumstances you're going through. Define your life by how good you have it in Christ. And I tell people, if you need a crash course on how good you have it in life, read 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, because it'll get you through anything. And just read Romans chapter 8. That's a good crash course on Christianity and how good you have it. You got to focus on that. Bow with me in prayer, if you would.